On Tuesday, President Obama unveiled, unveiled, excuse me, his new plan to control American businesses, American citizens, emissions of carbon dioxide as a result of burning fossil fuels. Now, a similar plan was presented to the U.S. Senate 14 years ago called the Kyoto Protocol, and the Senate rejected it. And other countries signed this Kyoto Protocol where they offer incentives for people not to burn fossil fuels so that the carbon dioxide will not be released with the objective of reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Other countries signed it. We didn't. 14 years went by. Guess who reduced more carbon emissions? The European Union or the United States, equivalent societies and economies? Well, it was the United States that had the greatest reduction in carbon emissions, carbon dioxide, into the U.S. atmosphere. Excuse me, into the world atmosphere. Because it's not a U.S. atmosphere. And that's an important point to keep in mind. So. Why was it that we needed this plan if we were already the first ones to meet the targets that were set by the Kyoto Protocol before all the countries that had implemented a lot of regulations, a lot of uh, plans, and we reduced carbon dioxide more than them? Obviously, we're doing fine if our objective is to reduce carbon dioxide, we're beating them without the, all the regulations. And when I say all the regulations, I'm talking about 1,600 pages of new regulations that will burden American business and American citizens because it will introduce new incentives to do this or that, new requirements, more lawyers to be hired, more accountants to be hired, and for what? We're already beating the European Union anyway. Now, guess how we beat them? Free market operates very well, and we substituted a lot of the coal burning for gas, natural gas, and natural gas emits less carbon dioxide than the burning of, of coal, so, that's why we reduced it. And Obama in his speech admits that, but he doesn't explain why we had such a great reduction in carbon dioxide. He doesn't explain that it was the switch to natural gas. He doesn't explain that it was done without regulation. He doesn't explain exactly what happened. So here we are one more time. Obama is trying to legislate instead of execute the laws. Instead of using an executive order, as he usually tries to do, he is using the EPA. Now, this amounts to fundamentally distorting the balance of power of our Constitution. It is the Congress that is supposed to legislate, and then the executive is supposed to implement the laws. But Obama, the constitutional lawyer, doesn't uh, know this or wants to ignore it or is lured by the power to be the legislative body and the executive body, do whatever he wants, violate the Constitution. This is governmental illegality at the top which is worse than any kind of illegality by any citizen because it corrupts the whole system. And if you want to read somebody or hear somebody that knows a lot about this, I suggest Bruce Fine, a constitutional scholar who I interviewed on this precise topic. Anyway, this is what his plan is. He wants to legislate a treaty that was rejected by the Congress. 
In other words, we already know what the Congress thinks about implementing these kind of controls. So he's going to go around the Congress and try to do this through the EPA. Now, how is it that the EPA will be able to get jurisdiction over this and implement this roundabout plan to legislate? It's very interesting. And here is some interesting sleight of hand. How does it work? First, the EPA calls carbon dioxide a harmless gas that doesn't do any harm to you, to your health at all. It calls it a pollutant, you know, like smoke, soot, lead in the air. Now, by changing the meaning of the word pollution and pollutant and using it to apply to a gas that doesn't have any harmful effects. We've been breathing uh, carbon dioxide uh, since there were human beings on the earth and the animals as well. And it doesn't do any harm. And there's a very small amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere anyway. It doesn't do any harm. It's not harmful, but they call it a pollutant. So Obama uses first this authority. Well, let's go back. Th this is how the uh, EPA got authority over this whole subject matter by just calling something carbon dioxide a pollutant when it's not a pollutant. So that's the first step. Now, when Obama presents the argument, he uses the sleight of hand of equivocation. And very interesting. He talks about when he came to Los Angeles from Hawaii for the first time. He goes for a run in Los Angeles and he's choking because of all the smog that was in Los Angeles 1977, I think it was. So he's talking about carbon uh, pollution, but in Los Angeles, it wasn't carbon pollution carbon dioxide pollution, it was smog, smoke, carbon particles that get into your lung, lead in the air. This is real pollution. It's harmful to your, to your health. And so he choked when he went for his run. But you can breathe air with carbon dioxide as much as you want, and you will never choke. It's not harmful and it doesn't create asthma or any sicknesses or anything. So in his argument, which is a classic example of equivocation, he uses a situation of pollution, meaning something that harms your health, like smoke and carbon particles and lead. And then later in the latter part of the argument, he says, you see, that's why we need these carbon dioxide controls, he calls it a carbon pollutant. There is no carbon dioxide pollutant, except that the EPA wants to call it that, but there is none because it's not harmful to your health. And you won't choke by breathing atmosphere that has carbon dioxide. If that were the case, we'd be choking for a million years. Anyway, this is the sleight of hand that's used by Obama in his argument. And I thought it would be interesting to point it out. It's a classical example of equivocation, which means using a word, carbon pollutant or pollutant, let's just say pollutant, in one part of the argument to mean one thing, something that really harms your health, and in the other part of the argument some, to mean something that doesn't harm your health, you just want to call it a pollutant. And throughout the speech, he talks about carbon pollutant. Now, carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. It doesn't harm your health. So that's the first thing. Now, let's examine the argument that uh, Obama is making and the EPA is making. First, he, they claim that the Americans are burning too much fossil fuel and therefore increasing the uh, CO2, carbon dioxide levels in, in the atmosphere. 
and that carbon di that's the first point then carbon dioxide is the major gas responsible for the greenhouse effect and therefore the increase they say in temperature in the world and so if you implement these controls on carbon dioxide emissions you will reduce the greenhouse effect and you will therefore reduce the increase in temperature and of course the increase in temperature is supposed to create a calamity catastrophes the solar caps melting etc now let's focus on some facts because they they are counting on you not knowing the facts in fact some of these facts i didn't know myself were very interesting so let's talk about the facts about carbon dioxide now how much carbon dioxide is in the air do you know i didn't <laughs> until i looked it up there is 0. 0.0004 of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide that means that 0.04 percent of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide now last century it was 0. 0.03 so this is the big increase this the increase is from 0. 0.03 percentage of the atmosphere to 0. 0.04 percentage of the atmosphere so we're talking about a 0.01 percent of the atmosphere is more carbon dioxide than not than before the industrial revolution or the 20th century if you go back that's the big change so that's a big change from 0 0.03 to 0 0.04 but what does 0 0.04 mean okay it means that one if you had one percent of the atmosphere we're not talking something much smaller than one percent you would have to divide that one percent in 25 parts and we're talking about one of those parts so they're claiming that this small part of the atmosphere this minute increase in the amount of carbon dioxide and the absolute amount of carbon dioxide is causing this great change in the greenhouse effect and changing increasing the temperature and going to create a calamity in the future with the uh, ice caps melting and who knows how many more things incredible amount of hurricanes that never happen climate change etc anyway what is the truth about this? Well, the first truth is that the American citizens, by burning fossil fuels, are not responsible for the major part of the increase in carbon dioxide. Burning fossil fuels does not, is not the major cause of the increase in carbon dioxide. And the Americans, anyway, are an insignificant, infinitesimal amount of people and activity that you could not even measure how much they are contributing to the increase in carbon dioxide but more importantly it's not carbon dioxide that is responsible for the greenhouse effect the main gas that is responsible for the greenhouse effect which is that when the sun goes through the atmosphere and wants to bounce back in infrared heat radiation, the greenhouse effect keeps it closer to the earth and doesn't let it escape out into space. That's the greenhouse effect. And the gas that is responsible for most of the greenhouse effect is water vapor not carbon dioxide and you can know this very easily because 
The other gases, which are nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, which are about 98% of the, of the atmosphere, they have no effect on the greenhouse. If they don't have a greenhouse effect. They don't stop the rays coming through, or they don't stop the heat radiation bouncing back. But water vapor, which is about 2% on average, because of course it evaporates and goes back and forth, of the atmosphere, it is a greenhouse gas, and it does create the greenhouse effect, 2%. So 2% we ignore. That could not be the cause, water vapor. But 0.04% or 0.01%, which is the increase, oh, that is the cause. So if you really want to worry about uh, the greenhouse effect, you should focus on water vapor because a minute difference in the amount of water vapor in the air will eclipse all the effect of carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide, far from being a pollutant, is essential to life. If we reduced, got rid of all the carbon dioxide, we had some way of getting rid of it. You know what would happen? We would all die. That's right, die. Carbon dioxide, which is at a pretty low level in, in historic times, it's been more, is what the plants need to live. That's how they get their carbon. They get it from the C in the CO2, and they release oxygen, which is good for us. So. If there was no carbon dioxide, no plants, no plants, no animals, everybody dies. So if, if we, we have a very small amount of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere, if we reduce it even more and we were able to get rid of it, that would really be a calamity. That would kill everyone. And of course, reducing it to 0 0.02 would probably also be a calamity. So, this extra small amount of carbon dioxide is greatly appreciated by the plants. They can grow better and they can provide more food and energy for us and more oxygen. So it's not a bad thing, it's a great thing. So something that most people don't realize, uh, don't uh, get what you hope for there because you might be sorry about it. Anyway, here's an important interesting fact to focus on another bit of sleight of hand. Why did they change the name? You remember all this argument that I presented is an argument for how to reduce global warming. That was the name before. But, well, let's go through the argument again just a second. The, I already explained why it's not carbon dioxide that is the major, major gas responsible for the greenhouse effect, it's water vapor. But another important fact is that the world's temperature, the most important factor governing the world's temperature is sun activity. If there are a lot of sun spots, a lot of sun activity, it gets hotter here. If there's much less, it'll get colder, regardless of carbon dioxide or anything else. Also, the wobble in the earth the, that it occurs because of the, the, uh, the inclination on the axle, when it changes, it has effects on how much light gets into the polar caps, et cetera. That is a factor that's greater than carbon dioxide. So the idea that the greenhouse effect is the major thing determining the temperature on the earth is totally mistaken. So th that's another part of the argument that doesn't hold water. So we're going over the argument, it's not the Americans burning fossil fuels that are increasing carbon dioxide in the, in the, in the atmosphere. Even if they did, it's a, such a minute amount that it has hardly any effect on the greenhouse effect. Water vapor is it. And, and thirdly, it's really the sun. And Obama might think he can control all this stuff, but I hope he doesn't think he can control the sun because uh, his hubris has to have some, his hubris or hubris 
has to have some kind of limit there. <laughs> anyway, why did they change the name from global warming to climate change? It's a very interesting sleight of hand there again. Now, climate change is something that nobody can deny. Whereas global warming caused by an increase in carbon emissions, carbon dioxide, and whether reducing the this small by a very small amount, the amount of carbon dioxide that there is in the atmosphere will have any effect on temperature, uh, and whether these Kyoto uh, Protocol plans ever had any effect on how much carbon dioxide uh, there is in the atmosphere, and I already point out they had less effect than the uh, unregulated capitalist uh, system in the United States. All these things uh, have to be considered as to why they changed the name. Now, they changed the name because if you argue for that there's going to be global warming as a result of the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you can be proven wrong in many ways. You can be proven wrong because the temperature doesn't go up so much. Or you can be proven wrong because it went up, but it wasn't the greenhouse effect. Or you can be proven wrong because it wasn't the carbon dioxide that created the greenhouse effect. It was, like I said before, the main gas that you would want to look at, which is water vapor. You can be proven wrong. But if you argue that there's going to be climate change in the future, nobody can argue against that. Everybody agrees. We don't control the climate. You know, we don't control the weather. We don't control the climate. That's something we have to deal with. And Obama thinks he can control the climate. <laughs> and so he doesn't realize how big the world is and how much atmosphere there is and what are the proportions. And uh, his power is absolutely limited. And so anyway, this is why they changed the name, because you cannot measure climate change. So I said, if I said to you, uh, there's going to be more climate change in the future, and you say, well, I say, well, of course, there's always climate change. Well, you say, no, no, the rate of climate change is going to increase. I say, well, from what to what? What is the unit of measurement that indicates how much climate change there is? Because when you talk about global warming, there's a thermometer, and we know the temperatures. But climate change, there isn't any unit to measure whether there has been an increase the things that they talk about, hurricanes, well, they're down, so they don't focus on that. Well, is, if this thing or that thing, it is a nebulous concept that doesn't mean anything specific, and there's no way to measure whether there's been climate change or not, how much there was or not, and you can't lose the argument. In fact, I don't know anybody who's arguing that there won't be climate change in the future. It's either going to get colder or hotter. Either there's going to be a lot more rain or a lot less rain. Everything, there's going to be more hurricanes or less hurricanes. Whatever, you, whatever happens, well, there was a change. So you can claim that there was climate change. That's why they changed the name. And that's why, so you can't think through this problem because you're stuck with a, a, a concept that doesn't really mean anything clear. That's the problem. That's why I left it for last. Anyway, the most, the last thing I want to say is this. The motivation behind all these EPA regulations and controls are the same motivation that the socialists, the redistributionists always have, which is control. They want to control other people's efforts, other people's wealth, other people's action. It's the lust for power. That's why they do it. Sometimes they're not even aware of it, but that's the main motivation. They want to control. 
And we have to say no. We have to stop them. So thanks for paying attention.